Let me welcome you to our study on discipleship today, and it's good to be with you again this day, whatever time of the day you are uh, viewing this. I tend to say welcome to our time this morning or this evening, depending on what time I'm doing this. It happens to be morning right now, but we are in a lesson that we began a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you should have the notes. It's called Discipleship and Lordship. And we've already talked about, you know, some of the basic meanings of the word disciple, what it means and what is involved in being a learner, okay? We talked about uh, things that uh, you have to have in your life. This morning, I want to begin, and uh, we're just going to take a small section because I want to spend time in this entire thought here. And on your outline, you should find it on the first page, four areas of life which in which to develop, okay? The areas of your life that you need to develop and work on if you're going to be an effective disciple and an effective discipler, okay? And so there are four things I mentioned there. Uh, there's character, proficiency in ministry, conviction, and perspective, okay? And perspective is on the next page over, and you'll see that. And then we'll finish up next uh, week in the, in the final part of this lesson. But I want to talk about these things that need to be developed because <clears throat> they're very important. And again, I know that some of the stuff that we are saying um, goes back again and again uh, in some kind of a repetitive form. And I say some of the th same things over, but it is absolutely important that we hear them again and again and get them down. And so let's get right to it. And the very first thing that we have to work on developing in our life, because if we do not develop this in our life, we will not be able to see it effectively developed in the life of those that we are discipling, and character is the very first thing. And for that, I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, if you will, in your Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, again, I've alluded to this, I've referred to this, we've read this, but we're going to read it again and talk about some of the thoughts that are here. Because I think this is one passage that really uh, brings out the power of character and how important it is that we develop these things in our life. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, and, and beginning with verse 3, okay, uh, Peter writing says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Very simple. God has given us everything we need to live the Christian life and to live it godly, okay? Through the knowledge of him that hath called you to glory and virtue. And you notice the word virtue there. We're going to come back to that in a minute. It said, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by these great promises, we might be partakers of the divine nature. What a marvelous thing. God is allowing us to have his nature, and we have that through the working of the Holy Spirit, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Because God has come into us, we've escaped. We, we, we've come beyond that corruption, and we can live a different life. Now, verse 5, he said, and beside this, or in addition to these things, okay, beside this, giving all diligence. Now, this is not challenging you to do just something, my, you know, slightly, but giving everything you've got, giving all diligence, he says, add to your faith. Now, the presumption is that you've already believed in Jesus Christ. You you have the faith that he's talking about. So add to that. Don't stop there. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now notice the next verse. For if these things be in you and abound, or it's not net, not, not enough, just to say, yeah, well, I have a little bit of patience, or I have a little bit of love. No, no, you're, they're in you and they abound. They're, they're exceedingly abundant, okay? He said, they make you that ye shall neither be barren, all right? And we've talked about that means basically unemployed, You'll not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's talk about these things that are here and, and get an idea of what he's saying that needs to be in our life. And this kind of gives us, a, I think, a, a, a good picture. Maybe there's some other things we could add to it about what kind of character we need to be developing. Now, 
again, let me just say this and, and uh, to reemphasize, unless I have the character that God expects me to have, I'm not going to pass it on to those that I'm trying to disciple. We cannot set a dual standard, okay? We must achieve those things that we are trying to teach others to achieve. So the first thing he says, add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Really, it's moral goodness. It really is excellence of character. And I'll tell you what, we are lacking a lot of virtue today. We talk about ethics committees. And there's just a lot of virtue lacking. Just the general things that we would think of like honesty and integrity and, you know, just living a positive uh, life that is above board. But the Bible says I need to add to my faith virtue, this moral excellence, okay? So write that down if you're writing notes down. And the, this is a good passage to come back to again and again as a, as a passage that will challenge you or I to see whether or not we are living the way God would have us to. <clears throat> and then he says, to add to your virtue, notice, knowledge. Now, the, the knowledge that he's talking about here is, is not just the mental knowledge, but it is a knowledge of experience. Okay, so let me define this way. A knowledge of right coupled with the practice of it. A knowledge of right coupled with with the practice of it. That is good character. I know what is right, and I am doing what is right. There are many people that know right but don't do it, and that is an indication of poor character, okay? So we've got to have this good character that is so important in our life. So now we've got virtue, that moral excellence that needs to be continually built into our life, and then knowledge, okay? Now, knowledge is learning. I understand that. And we have to, de we have to devote ourselves to the study of God's Word, to getting knowledge in it, in our, in our mind. But we have to couple that knowledge, the gaining of that knowledge, with the practice of it. That is good character. Then, he says temperance. This is self-control. This is lacking so much in our world today. You know, we, we just don't have the control of our emotions and our uh, desires and things like this and our thinking. I mean, everything is important. I need, to, I need to be in control. And as a disciple, I nef definitely need to practice discipline. That Many other verses in the Bible talk about this. You could search them out. But... As one trying to disciple others, I have to be disciplined as well. I have to have this self-control. For instance, you and I may be uh, visiting with one, trying to instruct them and encourage them, and it's easy sometimes for us to attack people who do not necessarily agree with us on certain things, and that's a lack of self-control, okay? Because we, we, in our pride, we think we have all the answers, and someone, you know, is a little bit different in their opinion about something, and we attack them. That's a lack of self-control. And there are many, many other areas. We just need self-control. We've got to have this in our life, okay? No matter what it is, you know, I, um, it, it could be something as simple as, you know, not eating too much, okay, <laughs> or eating the wrong thing. Believe me, I, that, that's something that I need. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I think about it every time I go back for seconds. Do I need it? Should I be doing it? And my old flesh says, yeah, you want it? Go get it. Well, self-control would allow me to say no and force me to say no. But then patience, okay? He says to uh, to that self-control or that temperance and patience. Now, the patience that is talking about here is not necessarily being patient with people. I think that's going to come in a minute. But it is the concept of endurance, okay? Being able to endure and stay with it. And again, this is character. You know, you, 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 you always hear about the, those who want to jump on the bandwagon while all the excitement is going on, but when it gets down to the nitty-gritty and the hard work and this, the day-by-day day of performing the duties, they're jumping off. 
That's what the endurance means here, is the idea of, of putting your mind to the job and staying with the job. I tell you what, it, it is to me a blessing to see anybody who has been at it for many, many years and they are still going at it. And they still have a vision. They still want to keep on going. You know, the idea of me in, in any capacity just stopping and not doing the Lord's work in some capacity. I know that as we get older and time changes, our our ministry changes to some effect, okay? But I am not interested in sitting in a rocking chair whittling on a piece of wood for the rest of my life. I want to be involved. I want to endure to the end. And enduring means I stay with the job God has given me to do. And when you you sign on, if you will, to be a disciple and a discipler, it's a lifetime commitment, okay? So endurance. And then he says godliness. Add to your um, patience godliness. And I think the word godliness is generally understood. Uh, it, it is doing those things that please God. You know, in life, you're either going to please men or you're going to please God. As a disciple of Jesus, you're either going to please him or you're going to please man. And that man that you are pleasing may be yourself, but you're still pleasing man. And so it's very important that we understand what he's talking about right here. Then he says, add to that godliness, brotherly kindness. <clears throat> now that is the word Philadelphia, okay? We get our, our city Philadelphia for it. It's supposed to be the city of brotherly love, but some of the things I hear coming from there that doesn't always indicate that. Now, the, the love of our fellow believer should be strong because this is somewhat of a, uh, a, a, a family-style love. And basically, I think what Peter's saying here is that you and I ought to love one another. Now, you say, well, that's what the Bible says. Yes, <clears throat> but there should be a special joyous, uh, kind feeling that you and I have toward others who are in the body of Christ, no matter how we may disagree. You know, Paul deals with that in Romans 14. You know, some may think you can eat this, and some may say you can't eat this. But basically, he says, don't be judgmental toward each other. And you can say that he's really telling them, get along, have a fondness for each other. That's the idea of Philadelphia or brotherly kindness is having this. And, you know, I, 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 I just want to say this from the bottom of my heart. It grieves God, and, and it grieves me when I see Christians who have animosity toward other believers over foolish things, things that really should not be. And uh, we, we just need to have this brotherly kindness. It's a character trait. And then he says, add to that brotherly kindness, charity. Now, you know the word charity is the Greek word agape, and it is, it is uh, love. It is a love that is chosen. Okay, I will love you because I choose. So what is the difference in these two thoughts? On one hand, he says, uh, have brotherly kindness, which is the word Philadelphia, a fondness for people. And the other is a love. And we know it is a love I choose. I will love you no matter what. Well, I think in the context, and, and this is my opinion, and, and you know, I'm sharing some things also that I've read, but uh, I love my brethren, the brotherhood, okay? I love my fellow believers. I have this fondness. But I also need to have a love to the entire human race, okay? Uh, no matter who they are, even if they are those that may be persecuting me, I have to love them because this love to all mankind is what God expects for you and I. If God loved the world and Jesus loves the world, then I am to love the world as well. And so this takes in everybody, okay? I'm not to say, I love you, you're my brethren, you're my fellow believers, you go to my church. You're not a believer, you don't go to my church, I don't have anything to do with you. No, we love everybody. Now, this is character, okay? And this is what we're talking about. I've spent some time here because I think we could take these thoughts, we can analyze our life, judge ourselves 
by these thoughts and ask ourselves, are these things true in me and am I developing them on a daily basis? Because we never reach the pinnacle of what they are in this life. We've got to constantly be building this, constantly increasing in this moral excellence, this virtue, increasing in my knowledge and the performance of that which I know, day by day becoming more self-disciplined in my life, having this endurance that just keeps me going every day. It gets me up. It gets me going. No matter what the trials may be, no matter the difficulties that I have, I just keep on going. And I have this godliness, this character in me that causes me to want to please God in all things, okay? And then I have this brotherly kindness. <laughs> I'm going to say to you that are listening, you know, I love you. I really do. I don't know who all is listening, but I shouldn't have to say that. My actions ought to show that, that I love you. But then I ought to have that charity for everybody, no matter who they may be. So character. Now the next thing that you'll see on your outline is the concept of proficiency in ministry. Now take your Bible and turn to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 7, and we'll look at verse 31, read a couple of verses here, and then comment on, on the latter part of the chapter there. But I want you to see the whole story here. Mark 7, 31, and again departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephata, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more, a great deal, they published it. Now notice verse 37. And they, uh, and, and were beyond measure astonished, those who have published it, and that, that they were beyond measure uh, saying, now what do they say about Jesus? He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. He hath done all things well. Now, we wouldn't expect anything less from the Lord Jesus Christ. He was proficient in the ministry. He did all things well. They bring on him a guy that can't hear, can't speak, and the Lord touches his ears and his tongue, and he can speak and hear at this time, and they are amazed. Now, folks, in being a disciple, in being a discipler, we do not have room for mediocrity, okay? Uh, I don't care how young you may be or how old you may be or where you are in between the two. Always be striving to develop the proficiency in the ministry. You know, uh, and I don't have anything to go but just personal experience and desire. I've been preaching for 50 years, <laughs> but I want to learn more. I want to be able to do it better, and and I'm I'm working on that. And and you know, I know you may be thinking, well, I hope you hurry up. <laughs> I do too. No, seriously, I'm working on it. I want to be the best that I can, and that is the goal we should always have in our life. Lord, help me to be the very best. And this is this is a proficiency, a commitment to excellence. Because if you settle for less, those that you disciple will do the same. Because if you set a standard right here for yourself, those that you disciple usually will only come about here. And if they then use that, the people they dis d decide to disciple will come. And you see, it just continues to collapse. We've got to set a very high standard for ourselves. And as we do then we challenge those we are discipling to set a high standard for themselves, and we, we don't have this de degrading of what uh, we should be doing in the Christian life. Discipling 
is just very important, okay? Set that high standard. Teach uh, the same. But, you know, I will say this. Have mercy when they fall short, okay? And, um, you know, you, you treat them like you would, go, you would want God to treat you when you fall short of the standard God has set. Now, you set the standard... And you have compassion when they don't make it. And you challenge them not to not to settle for that, but to get up and go on and try it again, okay? This is proficiency in ministry, okay? Now, let's go to the next one, conviction. And I'm not talking about a preference, okay? I'm talking about a conviction, something that you are firmly convicted about that you must be doing. And if you have a conviction of being a disciple and making disciples, if you have that conviction, you will both be a disciple and a discipler. We go back again to uh, Matthew chapter number 28, verse 19 and 20. When again, we read it, we reread it because we got to keep thinking about it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Make disciples, okay? A dis, you know, evangelize them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In other words, we evangelize, we make a disciple of them, we identify them with the local church through baptism, and then we begin the process of discipling. Now, keep that in mind. Discipling is not a program that some man has designed. It is a mandate from God. Now, here's why this is important. You have this conviction. It's deep in your heart, okay? Uh, I, I believe I am to be a disciple. I read it in the Bible. And as a disciple, as a true follower of Christ, I am to be making disciples as well. Unless I hold that conviction regarding the ministry, then when difficulties come, when time passes, and when weariness sets in, it will cause me to give up. And let me tell you that as a disciple, as a discipler, difficulties will come. Time will pass. And with the passing of time, there will be weariness, sometimes very much weariness, sometimes prolonged weariness. And if you are not convicted in your heart, hey, this is a mandate from God for me, then those difficulties, that passing of time, that weariness will cause you to think, you know, I've done this long enough. And you may stop way short of the time that God would have you to stop. And God's stopping clock, by the way, is when he takes us on to glory, to be with him. So we've got to develop character. We've got to develop proficiency in ministry, always striving to be better. And we've got to develop this conviction. Let it grow more and more every day in your life. And then we have to have perspective. And that's something we develop as well in our life. This is the ability to see the end as well as the beginning. You know, in John chapter 6, there's an interesting thought in verse number 5. Of course, Jesus is about to feed the multitude, but in John 6, all right, in verse number five, give you a chance to find it. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great multitude, uh, a great company rather, come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When sh shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, if you stop there, you might have to ask, didn't the Lord have any idea what he was going to do? Of course he did. In the next verse, this said, this he said to prove him, for he, that is Jesus himself, knew what he would do. Now, I know we are not the Lord, and, and I can't, you know, know 
perfectly what tomorrow will bring or even this afternoon. But here's the thing. I can have faith in the Word of God. And discipling, being a disciple, demands that we have faith in God's Word and a patience to wait on the Lord always for the fruit that He will give us. You know, a verse that has been quoted many times by many people, and it's a great verse, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 31. If you want to look at it, Isaiah 40 and verse 31. And if this has not become a part of your life already, it needs to be, okay? Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, that's what you're talking about, perspective. Lord, I'm doing your job. I'm staying at it. I've got a conviction regarding this. I'm trying to, uh, you know, become proficient in this. And I'm trying to develop the character that I can pass on. But I'm waiting. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here's the thing. We may not see all the fruit of it in this life as we may not see all of our prayers answered in this life. But as we wait on the Lord, God will do the work that God will do. And that's an amazing thing. This is perspective. You see, I'm not, I'm not working for an immediate result today. I, I'm trying to plan for the long term. And this is what we're talking about when we say perspective in this matter. And so these are characteristics that we've got to put into our life. And, and they're very, very important. Uh, and when you think about it, we, we, we find this over and over again in the Bible. In, in, in John 8 and verse number 12, we, we read a, a verse here again, John 8 and verse number 12, just kind of summarizing this. It said, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, one thing about the disciples in the New Testament, we know they followed Jesus. So how can we do this? How can we follow Jesus? Well, first, by, first, by knowing how he lived. And second, by knowing what he taught. You see, uh, then when we know what he, how he lived and what he taught, we want to begin to follow his example. First Peter chapter one, uh, chapter two and verse 21, first Peter 2, 21, the Bible says that Jesus gave us an example. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. So a disciple follows Christ. He knows how he lived. And it is important that we really analyze the life of Christ. What did he do in certain situations? And then we know what he taught and we put that into practice. Secondly, in John chapter 13 and verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, this is the badge of discipleship. We follow Christ and we love one another. Now, there, there may be those with whom we disagree on in non-essentials, okay? But voicing that before the world in an unloving way does not further the kingdom of God. The world is to see our love one for another above all other things. And unless a man is a heretic, we ought to always speak of them with love. Now, if he's a heretic, we, we don't hate him. You know, we love him for God's sake, but we may have to identify the heresy that he's teaching. Our attitude toward other believers will be reproduced in the disciples we have. If I am critical and harsh uh, about everybody that I disagree with, I will pass that along to my disciples. As a disciple, I need to be following Christ knowing how he lived, knowing what he taught, and in implementing that into my life as well, and always loving one another. Well, thank you. Our time is up, and I enjoy doing this. I trust that it is a blessing to you. 
as well. God bless every one of you today. Let's be a disciple and let's make disciples.